I would like for you to picture the first time you kissed someone you really liked. <laughs> How did you feel? Did you have this funny feeling in your stomach? Were you flying a few inches above the ground, maybe? This is an example of uh, something that I call a goosebump moment. I love goosebump moments. <laughs> they make me feel present, they make me feel connected, and they make me feel alive. And there are three things that never fail to give me goosebumps, apart from kissing. <laughs> climbing mountains, this is me climbing Mont Blanc in Europe last summer. Listening to my favorite music, and yes, tomorrow with my friends, we are going to Los Angeles to see Red Hot Chili Peppers live in their home city. I'm so excited for this. <laughs> and finally, basically everything about space exploration. And today, I would like to share with you my favorite moments in the history of space exploration. Let's begin our journey with our one and only natural satellite you all know as the Moon. You know the story. Everything started in the late 1950s. Two super countries decided to join the space race and send people to the most expensive picnic in the history of humankind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, picnic. Uh, even though it costs $200 billion by today's value of money, $200 billion, landing on the moon had no major scientific value. This is literally what I was told when I was visiting Kennedy Space Center last summer. But yet, it gives me goosebumps even now when I'm thinking about it. Ever since life began on our planet 3.8 billion years ago, this is the first time we managed to leave our planet and, and land on another astronomical body the same astronomical body that our ancestors had been seeing for thousands and thousands of years on their clear night sky, but could never reach. Can you imagine that NASA was founded in 1958 and managed to put humans on the moon in only 11 years? I mean, YouTube is 12 years old, and it's, <laughs> it's not even profitable, probably. <laughs> Let me tell you about my favorite goosebump moment from that time. Uh, you, you've probably all seen the, the sunrise or the moonrise, right? There is a picture from that time which is my favorite and it's called the air fries. I like this picture so much that I even printed it, framed, and it's sitting in my apartment back in Poland, where I'm from. This picture was taken by an astronaut, William Anders, on Christmas Eve 1968. And the reason why I put this picture in my apartment is to remind me to always, always keep everything in a proper perspective. You see, ever since famous astronomer Mikołaj Kopernik, or Nicolas Copernicus, as you may know him in English, <laughs> we, knew that we, are, we knew that we are not the center of the universe. But now, for the first time, we could actually see it. Let me put it this way. When you were a child, your whole universe, your whole world, was just your house and maybe a backyard. And then, when you were growing up, your world was expanding to your school, to your neighborhood, to the whole city, to other cities, to the whole country, to other countries, and for some of us, even continents. With every new perspective, you, with every new place, you get a new perspective. And that's exactly why, why the air fries is so important. This is the first time we, as humanity, gained this new perspective, collectively. For that reason, the air fries was dubbed one of the most important pictures in the history of humankind. It's a symbol for calls to global unity and peace. And it also started modern environmental movement. So landing on the moon and getting this new perspective is our first goosebump moment. In the next 40, 40 years, we did to, uh, to space exploration the same thing Michael Jordan did to basketball. We made going to space look easy. <laughs> so we kept going. We performed a staggering 131 successful launches, launches of space shuttle. We built a big, badass camera call, called Hubble Space Telescope that we put into space to take pictures of deep space. We've also created a flying lab uh, called the International Space Station, where we can conduct experiments in microgravity. Beginning of 1970s, we started sending out a number of uh, sp unmanned spacecrafts in order to explore 
beyond our low, low Earth orbit. There is probably eight of them that are important, but my favorite by far is Voyager 1. You, Voyager 1 was launched in 1977, so 40 years ago, and currently it's 20 billion kilometers from planet Earth. It's the first object to leave our solar system in the history of humankind. And also, since the beginning of my speech, it already traveled 3,000 miles, which makes it also the fastest object we ever created. <laughs> the original mission of uh, the Voyager was to take pictures of Jupiter and Saturn. And this brings me to my second favorite goosebump moment. After passing Jupiter, NASA decided to turn Voyager around and take the last picture of our solar system from a distance. Here is a part of this picture. In the middle, you can see a tiny dot. Over there, let me help you. <laughs> uh, this tiny dot is our planet. And this picture is called the pale blue dot. It has, it's, not, it's not beautiful. Uh, and it, again, it has no major scientific value. But let me quote fragments what famous uh, astronomer Carl Sagan said about this picture. That's home. On it, everyone you ever heard of. Every young couple in love. Every hopeful child. Every mother and father. Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there, on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. It underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish this pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Whereas the air price was about perspective, the pale blue dot reminds me how vast the universe is. And you can get intimidated by looking at this, this pale blue dot, but also you can turn around and get excited of how much more is there to explore. And this brings me to current days. And oh boy, it's hard not to get goosebumps. It's so many things happening all the time. <laughs> Just recently, Elon Musk announced that he is about to send two private citizens for a round trip around the moon as soon as end 2018. His company, SpaceX, promises to land humans on Mars just nine years from now. Nine years. NASA promises the same. But I'm not only talking about the big players. I'm talking also about startups like Planet Labs that produces small, efficient, like small like this, efficient uh, satellites that are capable of taking high definition pictures of our, our planet's uh, surface. Or the other startups called Made in Space. They produce the first zero gravity 3D printer that operates currently on board the ISS, the International Space Station. With all those things happening, do you know what, what, what gives me goosebumps when I think about the future? I have this little dream. You know that I like mountains, right? <coughs> there is a mountain on Mars. It's called Olympus Mons. It's 2.5 times taller than the tallest mountain on Earth, uh, Mount Everest. And in fact, it's the tallest mountain in our solar system. Can you imagine climbing this baby and listening to uh, Other Side by Red Hot Chili Peppers on top of it? <laughs> this is crazy. But yet, it's, it's, it's totally possible in, in my lifespan. I hope you got a little, at least a little bit excited about space, space exploration. Uh, maybe some of you even got some goosebump moments. Uh, let me finish my speech with one, one last remark. Every TED-like speech has some tangible idea that can change your life, change organizations, or change the world. <laughs> you may wonder, what is the tangible idea in my speech? Well, you are right. There is none. <laughs> my message to you is simply stop overthinking for a second. Stop looking for logic all the time. Tonight, get out. Put your favorite music on and look up at the stars. Get yourself a goosebump moment. Thank you. <laughs>